Hello, my name is Brother Justin, and I would like to talk to you about your car's warranty program. No, I'm here to talk about the Gospel of Mark, your faith in action. Sunday Silly on your Monday, or whenever you happen to be watching, is this. I told my wife she was drawing her eyebrows too high. She really looked surprised. So, We'll have a, oh, a nose itch this morning. My allergies, I don't know about you, but my allergies have just been nuts lately. Uh, we're going to be studying Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 25, the lamp. And of course, we'll make some applications from that as well. Why don't we begin with a pause and prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. And we want to have ears that hear, hearts that are receptive to your inerrant, Holy Spirit-inspired, infallible, and profitable word. Give us attentive hearts and minds now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will skip over our song for today and go straight to the Lumo Project video, Mark chapter 4 verses 21 through 25. You can follow along or just listen. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Okay, so not a lengthy passage of Scripture this week, so that's good. But we have lots of uh, bunny rabbit trail croft references that I would like to uh, chase down today to help us understand this passage better. We begin in verse 21. In your Scriptures, verse 21, Mark chapter 4. And he, that is Jesus, said to them, I believe that's the crowds, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket? or under a bed, and not on a stand. So from the context and the clue word them, it appears as this is another public teaching. For example, if you look at Mark chapter 4, uh, it says, With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. So from that passage at the end of our scripture here, I'm discerning that this is again a public teaching. Mark has, has bounced back outside of the private instruction that um, he had with his disciples. And this is a, again a public teaching, one of the parables he spoke publicly to the crowd. In Greek, Mark uses the definite article. So it's not just a lamp, it's the lamp. And the lamp is also the subject of the sentence. These clues with other biblical references uh, that I didn't bother to include, but they let us know that he's not referring to just any old lamp. The lamp in the immediate context is Jesus, the light of the world. We know that's what Jesus uh, is described, how Jesus is described in John chapter one, verse five, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or over or mastered it. Then in 8.12 of John, uh, during the Feast of Lights, what we know as Hanukkah, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus is the lamp. The lamp is Jesus. So if Jesus is the lamp, 
then why does it appear that he is hidden? Why does it appear that he's under a basket or on, under a bed? Why is he not on a lampstand to shine for all? What's with the secrecy? Remember the secrecy that we talked about, the mystery that we talked about of the kingdom in the last uh, chapter or so of chapter 4. Back in verse 11, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. And then here in verse 22, nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to the light. And we describe Jesus's ministry as one where he was pulling out from the public ministry. He's still healing and driving out demons, but as far as his teaching goes, he's only preaching through parables to the public, mysterious parables that are riddles for them to ponder, but they don't really get it. And it's only privately that he's explaining things to his disciples. Why is that? Why isn't he just broadcasting pure, undiluted truth about his identity and the kingdom of God to everyone? Well, this is a timing issue. Just like a lamp is not lit to be hidden, Jesus won't be a secret forever. He is the light of the world, and he will shine. When the time is right, then the church will broadcast his identity and message. When the time is right the church will broadcast his identity and message. But for now, it's not. He's going to be investing primarily in his uh, 12 apostles and the, the close disciples over the next year and a half or two years or so. We read some of similar passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But Jesus had to be crucified. And so they needed, to be, they needed to stay in the dark for the mission of the cross to be completed. Similar passage, Luke 12, 2 through 3, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. Whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Of course, we know the Great Commission was, in Matthew 28, is the manifesto of the church, if you will. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." Uh, subsequent passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just a few weeks later, or maybe even just a few days later, Jesus told the disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So there is that witness, that broadcasting, the, the shining of the light. In a broader sense, I think we could say that the lamp is also the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, his death, burial, resurrection, and repentance and faith uh, for the forgiveness of sins. So now that the divine mission of the cross is complete, we're on the other side of the cross, right? Prior to the cross, it was somewhat of a secret, somewhat of a mystery being concealed until the cross is complete. Now we're all on the backside of the cross. So it is now our privilege and responsibility to proclaim the gospel far and wide. And we remember when we were little kids, uh, those of us who grew up in the church, we probably learned that little song 
This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Stuff it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. That's where this comes from, this idea. And a uh, parallel passage, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. Now, first Jesus was, then he imparts that to us as well. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, in another sense, Jesus is still hidden, though, right? I mean, if Jesus is Savior and Lord, the Son of God, divine, why doesn't he make himself known to the world today? Why doesn't he show up? You know, um, well, he's going to. But of course, by then it will be too late for those who have not put their faith in him. He will show up in time, but he wants us to believe now. And so there is a revelation yet to come. The light to some degree is still hidden, but it will shine forth an unparalleled glory when he comes on that day. Second Peter chapter 1. Peter writes to the church, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He's talking about the return of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in the saints, to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. Whew, that's some good stuff. And then Revelation 19. This is the vision of his coming. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Glory. Now, verse 22 goes a little further to explain verse 21. For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to the light. So the secret of the kingdom will be disclosed. Jesus will be revealed. When you hide something, typically you usually plan on revealing it later. For a Christmas or a birthday present, for example, you wrap it up, 
you don't want your kids to find it, you st stuff it away somewhere so that they can't find it, but then you're gonna bring it out and they're gonna open it up and it's going to be revealed. Well, that's the same imagery here. We saw that. Mark chapter 4, verse 11, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. Uh, we already read Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. That same passage, virtually the identical phraseology. At that time, during Jesus' ministry, his later Galilean ministry, his glorious identity was concealed to some degree, to many, to most. But the seeds were being sown. They were being planted. And the kingdom and the king, Jesus, will be revealed 100% when the time is right. After the cross, death, burial, resurrection, and Pentecost. The same saying of Jesus, by the way, verse 22, was used by Luke as a warning against hypocrisy. The, these sayings were uh, probably used on multiple occasions, and the gospel writers felt comfortable using them in different circumstances under different contexts to apply different meanings. Um, so in Luke, Luke uses it to warn that uh, not to be hypocrites like, like the scribes and the Pharisees, for what we say will be revealed. Uh, things done in private will be exposed. Given enough time, the truth will come out. You know, so those of us frustrated with what's going on at Washington, D.C., who do we believe, who's really in the up and up, and, and who's, uh, you know, the dark state and all of that, the deep state, ultimately we don't know. But the truth will come out. 1 Timothy 5, the sins of some people are conspicuous, obvious, going before them to judgment but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So the idea there is the truth will come out. The truth will come out. Again, the hiddenness of Jesus was temporary. The secret now, in our sense, the secret is out. Ever since Pentecost, the secret of Jesus' identity uh, is out. Jesus is Savior and Lord, the Son of God. Repent and believe in Him for the forgiveness of your sins. So we need to be shining the lamp of Jesus Christ into a dark, lost, sinful world. That is our privilege and responsibility now as His people. Colossians 1 says, The mystery, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy and the power of, and how and that he powerfully works within me. Colossians 1, good passage about proclamation. Matthew 10, 26 through 27. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark Say in the light, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Remember, Jesus pulls them aside and privately explains the parables to them. Someday that truth is going to come out, and we have it right here. This is the truth that we received generations uh, ago from the apostles who heard the private teaching of Jesus. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. We've heard that before. The kingdom of God is not what people expect. You see that, especially in the parables, uh, the more extensive parable narratives in the Gospel of Matthew, for example. So we all need to listen carefully with faith. Listen up. Notice all the emphasis on hearing. Verse 4, before the parable of the sower. 
Listen. Verse 9. Excuse me. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then in the explanation of the parable of the sower, verses 15, 16, and 18 are those words hear, but those are those superficial hearing um, followers that, that it's in one ear and out the other kind of hearing. But verse 20 is the one, the, the seed sown, that hears and obeys and produces fruit. And now verses 23 and 24 again, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear, listen up. Verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. Are you getting it? Uh, you ever hear that phrase, I'm so poor I can't even pay attention? Uh, well, Jesus says you can't afford not to pay attention. You must pay attention. James 1, 19 through 22. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There is no idea in scripture of hearing without heeding. Anytime we hear the scriptures, the understanding is you need to follow up with action. This is not just a mental exercise. It's not merely cognitive. This is for life transformation. Hebrews 2.1, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So in the context of hearing, Come to verse 24b, the second part of that. And he says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. So this is an old Jewish proverb. Jesus didn't invent this saying. Um, it's an old Jewish proverb. To, and Jesus employs it to emphasize the necessity of paying attention. Elsewhere, it's, uh, for example, though, it's quoted in Luke in the context of generosity. So if you're generous with others, if you measure out a great portion to others, then God will be equally as generous back to you. Um, that's how it's used there. But here it's in the context of hearing and believing. If the hearers listen and believe the message the best they can, God will grant them even more clarity and understanding an opportunity for more. And of course, this idea fits well in the context of farming. This uh, saying is stuck in the middle of several parables about farming. And the farmer always reaps according to what he sows, both in what kind of seed is sown and how much he sows. So if you sow wheat, you're not going to get corn, you know. Um, and if you sow a little, you're only going to reap a little, generally speaking. But the hardworking farmer that get out the, gets out there and plows a lot and sows a lot, he has much more potential for receiving more back. That's the idea here. One person in class um, rightly described it as, say, learning mathematics. Uh, you have to learn and embrace and digest two plus two before you can get to, you know, trigonometry. You can't jump there to all the richness uh, of college calculus. You have to learn the basics. And as you're faithful in learning the basics, then you start building that, that understanding. It's the same way with the scriptures. For to the one who has, more will be given. So our gut reaction when we hear this is, wait, well, wait, that's not fair. Why should one who has be given more? Shouldn't God give things equally? We got to distribute the wealth, right? That's what our society and culture uh, is all about now. Equality in all things uh, so that everybody's fair, right? No. 
That's what Justin says. We may think that God must treat all individuals equally in order to be just, but that's just not true. God is just no matter what. He is the standard for justness. But as God, it is still his prerogative to grant understanding and revelation to whomever he, he chooses, whenever he chooses. And besides, he's not being unfair. He's rewarding those who have responded with faith, responded with understanding and true hearing and listening and applying. And so he's, he's responding to them. He's rewarding them because of their faithfulness. So the person who welcomes God's kingdom, the words of the kingdom, say is listening to these parables and really goes home and thinks about them and wants to know more and says, you know what, I think I'm going to go listen to that Jesus guy again, you know, and begins to welcome and receive the rule and presence of, of the kingdom in his life, more, more understanding will be given, more opportunity to obey and to share that with others. But the next phrase also teaches the flip side of this reality. And this is a little tough. This is a hard teaching. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And that's when we start saying, well, that's really not fair. He doesn't have any at all. We need to give him a little bit, shouldn't we? Well, let's think about this. What is God saying here? What is Jesus saying? The person who rejects God revelation will lose even what little understanding they had. They've got a little understanding, but their hearts are calloused and like the scribes and Pharisees, they do not believe and receive and act on it. They, they reject it and walk away from it. And so the door is closed a little bit further for them. That's scary. But the emphasis is we need to listen good the first time. You know, I used to, my parents, you better listen good, boy. You know. So, I put some parenthetical statements in here to help us understand this verse. For to the one who has the ability to hear and who applies that ability to hear, more understanding will be given to that one. But from the one who has not the ability to hear and therefore doesn't apply it, even what understanding he has will be taken away. It's a very dangerous thing to not act on the belief, act on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So how can we make some applications here for this? Let me set aside the Bible here. Uh, just two applications today. Not, you know, this is review, really. Um, first, the most important action we can take as disciples is to listen carefully with faith. Listen with carefully. Listen carefully with faith. Intent on responding. Uh, Proverbs 23, 12 says, Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. Again, this is not a class to expand your brain cells, okay? The purpose of studying the Word is life transformation for the glory of God, applying these truths to our heart and life and acting on them and letting God's Word transform our lives. So we need to listen carefully. Secondly, the secret is out. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Any of you old timers, Know that song, that, that hymn of faith? Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. You know, okay, stop singing, Pastor. I get it. But send the light. The secret of Jesus' identity was only for a period of time. After the cross, death, burial, resurrection, and Pentecost, from here on out, we proclaim the gospel light of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4. 3 through 6. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, unbelievers. 
In their case, the God, small g, of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So send the light. Not only do we receive the light into our lives, we let it transform us. The illumination of the word, the illumination of the gospel, the illumination of Jesus himself in our lives. We have the privilege and responsibility, the joy of taking that testimony and sharing it with others. So here's our closing word of prayer right at 30 minutes. Not too bad today. Some really powerful stuff in the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we believe that your son Jesus is the light of the world. Thank you for illuminating our darkness. Give us all hearts of faith to respond to the light we've been given. Give us ears to hear your words of truth and apply them to our lives. Finally, inspire your people to share that light with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today. I hope you made it all the way to the end. Some really great material here in the Gospel of Mark, uh, putting our faith in action. Until next time, God bless you. And hey, keep shining the light. Keep chasing after Christ.